General, we have you at the Pentagon, and you described an incident there where, without your knowing it, mm -hmm. race had intruded into really the performance of your duties. That's true. Uh, where do you move next from the Pentagon, and does race play a role there? Well, it does. It does. And I'm just thinking now, I want to collect my thoughts as we, as we move along from the, from the Pentagon, because uh, things really started to change uh, fairly, fairly rapidly uh, for me at that time. Uh, I went from there out to, a, uh, to a, an Air Defense Command uh, base, uh, Moses Lake, Washington. And um, from there, well, I went on over to, uh, to Klamath Falls, Oregon. But uh, we're getting a little bit ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. I completed the, uh, all of the undergraduate work off campus at, for, uh, at University of Maryland. No, I did this uh, off campus initially. Did all but the final semester uh, classes there. And so the Air Force decided that, uh, that I should go over to Maryland for my final semester mm -hmm. to get my bachelor's degree. I went over there and th that worked out very well. Came back to the Pentagon and uh, I heard that they were sending some students, uh, some military people, officers, to uh, graduate school. So I went over to talk to them in the education office. And as it turned out, they did have a slot open. They needed to have an individual with a master's degree in business administration. Mm -hmm. So I asked for it and got it. Mm -hmm. And I went over to George Washington University for one year. The normal course was, to, of course, time was supposed to be two years. But they said, if you can squeeze it into one calendar year, Mm -hmm. then we will let you go over and, and take this course. So I did, and it worked out very well. But now this is very interesting because uh, I understand that George Washington University had, for whatever reason, not admitted any African-Americans to the uh, graduate uh, school in really? business administration, mm -hmm. and that uh, my friend, uh, Gene Tyree, also a colonel, and I uh, were the... Uh, first to, uh, to go over there for this course. And that was very interesting because we really had to work real hard at it because it was compact and everything mm -hmm. was set up so that we had to do almost twice as much work in half the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I did notice, we both noticed, that some of the students would not talk with us mm -hmm. about the content of the course and if we had problems and we tried to get some idea of just what, how the others dealt with that particular problem, that they would simply change the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Gene Tyree and I decided at that time that we were not going to uh, do anything but max the course. And so we talked with our wives, mm -hmm. very open about it, and we told them that we were encountering some problems uh, we didn't think that we could would have any problem overcoming them, but it would take sa a sacrifice on their part of not having us immediately responsive to the things that they might want to do. Both wives agreed. Mm -hmm. And so between Chief Tyree, as I called him, and myself, we were either over at his home in his basement studying or we were in my upstairs room studying. And uh, my wife played a major role in my uh, getting through that course uh, quite successfully. She typed all of my term papers, mm -hmm. things that I had to do. And many a day, I would come out of my, my room uh, after having studied most of the night, grab a piece of paper from her. She's just getting it out of the typewriter and mm -hmm. dash off to the school. Soon, we found that, uh, that other associates, other students, were calling us to see how we dealt with particular problems. Mm -hmm. So just a little side thing. Yeah. Again, uh, so we did that. And um, then left that and uh, went on out to, uh, to uh, Moses Lake, Washington, 
And there I was on the battle staff with uh, uh, the intelligence officer during the Cuban crisis. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, was a very, very interesting experience to sit there and watch what was going on. And of course, as you know, the, um, the big issue was that one ship heading from Russia right. uh, had, was loaded with, uh, with additional missiles. And we had said that either we get the missiles out of Cuba or we will invade and uh, get to destroy them ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we did not cut the Canadians in on this. They were our partners in North, North American defense because we felt that this was purely an American thing. And we mm -hmm. wanted to do it ourselves. As you know, the story there that uh, they did turn uh, mm -hmm. turn around, turn the ship around and headed back and did but, take the missiles This out. is the closest mm -hmm. that we've come to nuclear war. That's right. That's right. Um, and it must have been incredibly tense. It was. It was very tense. We had uh, duty there. We were on duty for about 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of us felt that we were moving to the point where we would launch nuclear weapons mm -hmm. on one another. We had the... Uh, we had the doors to the silos open, mm -hmm. the missile silos. We had the aircraft were on their way to the targets and so forth. Really? They were. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there, was a, uh, there was a piece on this on television uh, several months ago that uh, documented this whole thing, that mm -hmm. it, where it was the closest that we ever came to having total nuclear war. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, that was a, a great experience one to be right in the middle of it, to making some decisions that were all minor because we were a sub of the total uh, North American Air Defense Command. But we had to track the aircraft to make sure that there were no incoming aircraft from, uh, from the Soviet side. And uh, we could, of course, see exactly uh, what was going on. Mm -hmm. So that was a, that was a really, a, really a, an excellent experience that I think brought realism to the uh, to the fact that that we were really close to war. To some extent, your experiences up to now might have easy parallels in the civilian world: mm -hmm. managing supply, managing yes. distribution, mm -hmm. computer work. But this, yes, there's no parallel. That is right, and that's why I tell everyone that. Um, when you go into the armed forces, you must understand that the armed forces, of course, has all of these other functions, mm -hmm. functions that are non-combat contact. Right. But, but in the final analysis, mm -hmm. you are responsible for supporting them and, if necessary, participating in the combat. Mm -hmm. and you must never forget that the only pre per reason for your existence is, of course, to engage the enemy if necessary and to vanquish them. Mm -hmm. And so I welcome the opportunity to do this as a sort of an additional duty, a part of the thing. I had the management analysis shop for that mm -hmm. organization, but I also had the responsibility of serving as the intelligence officer on the battle staff mm -hmm. in this uh, uh, blockhouse, as we called it. Mm -hmm. So, and then I went on to, um, to Klamath Falls, Oregon, mm -hmm. a small base out there a fighter base, and um, now that presented another one of these interesting problems. It was a small community, mm -hmm. uh, the community adjoining the base. We had an excellent commander, a fellow who had flown with, uh, uh, with the Flying Tigers during the conflict there in, uh, in China and mm -hmm. so forth. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, there are, understandably, there are clubs in town that uh, that are private clubs mm -hmm. and he had he went to them and said I have a number of uh, young people at the base which you sure like to negotiate something so that once in a while some of them could come into town and and utilize some of the facilities here mm -hmm. and certainly they do not have the money to join your club but uh, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could make these arrangements they turned him down cold mm -hmm. And I'm sure that part of it was on the basis that he had an integrated force out right. there. Well, he said, all right. He said, if you don't uh, 
permit them to utilize the facilities. He said, uh, then I'll just simply place the town off limits. Mm -hmm. uh, they responded to that I'm sure a few, they did. few days later, because knowing that this would, uh, would impact their economy, mm -hmm. a few days later they did agree to open the clubs and the other facilities to our people from the base.